record. Hello, hello. Hey! It's me, your cousin Sam. <laughs> and I'm Mason. And you know it's good when you hear right kind of company. Ah, uh, we we always get it wrong. Don't worry about it. It's a thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Mason, how are you today? Tired. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well, thank you. It's a little bit dark where I'm at. It's overcast, so it. it Lens to the spooky atmosphere. Uh, I'm wearing my Halloween best. You guys can't tell on camera, but I've got the Halloween hair. I've got on my stripes, very Tim Burton-esque, and I've got on my red Halloween lipstick. So I am ready for a brilliant review of a movie that did not go over well with the team. Water Boys! <laughs> <laughs> this movie, oh boy, I, the first five minutes, I was like, wow, a lot's happened already. We're like 15 minutes in, aren't we? And it was like three minutes. And I was like, this is who we're going real fast, aren't we? It was a yeah. lot. Ah. But like, it felt like this whole movie was a, and here's what you missed on, Glee. And it was like the recap of the last few seasons of Glee, but like smash cut into like one movie. That's what this so was. You cannot so you can understand why a movie like this with so much content would be turned into an entire series. Yeah, because they, they did not have enough time for this. This was two hours. A lot went down. <laughs> None of it made any sense. None of it made any sense. There's not a good group plot line. Um, character motivations are just non-existent for the most part. And wow, the writing was bad. At least the actors were charming. Um, yeah. So why don't you give this right. synopsis? Because clearly I don't know what it was. <laughs> okay, so the story is about a swimmer named Nam who is swimming for, I'm assuming maybe his high school, um, but he is swimming for his school and his dad is the swim coach and there's a new trainee that gets introduced to the swim team by the name of Mech. And Nam and Mech began a very close friendship very quickly, but both of them are dealing with some personal issues revolving around strained relationships with their fathers. And then there's also questioning sexualities kind of on both sides. Um, one due to behavior that maybe he's going through a lot of things to try to figure things out, whereas the other one is kind of completely in denial because I guess he's never asked himself the question. And so this is how everything unfolds. And that's the best I can do with the synopsis. Because like Mason said, there's not really a through line with this story. It really is just a lot of like bad relationships. Like you could rename this show Bad Relationships because yeah. it's a ton of really bad relationships. Yeah. This movie really really did its plot with and then instead of because. Like there's a thing that you'll learn in film school and it was actually started by the South Park creators. They had like a lecture like years and years and years ago about storytelling and their kind of idea was like, you need to have a cause for a thing to happen. So like, because Voldemort killed Harry's parents, Harry and him are tied together because this happened, that happens, and it leads to something else. Whereas you never want to be telling a story and then say, and then this happens, and then they do this, and then they do that, and then they went shopping, um, and then they had a fight, and then they were making out. Like, you need, and like, because this happened, that happened. And this movie really focused on the, well, and then they went swimming, and like, and then this girl showed up, and then they were just like, they went to a bar, and then this happened, and then that happened, and now they're in college! And you're like, what? Can we all slow down? Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like this movie reminds me of when somebody's telling you a story that mm -hmm. somebody else told them, and when the first person told the story to the second person, they have like shared friendship groups and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that didn't need to be explained. But when the second person explains it to the third person, they don't have that frame of reference. So there's a lot of things missing in the story. Yeah, someone went, here's the tea, and it took the whole dinner. Yeah, 
So that's the reason why I think this is a really hard watch for a lot of people. But there were some things that I found very valuable in this movie that I wanted to talk with Mason about. And that's why I was telling him before we got on live, I'm like, content. This movie has a lot of content. And I think that the content is worth discussion. So yeah. I want to start. <laughs> yeah. I want to start with the easiest part of the content. Um, the friendship group of people on the swim team. Mm -hmm. I, when I first watched this movie, my first thoughts were, this reminds me of the, qu the chorus from Hercules. Mmm, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, because, like, they don't really serve any purpose in terms of moving the story along. They're just kind of there as, like, a rallying cry or just, like, oh, my gosh, look what happened. Ooh. But... Other than like their very beginning of the movie where they kind of explain to Mech what it's going to be like being roommates with Nam, there doesn't seem to be anything else that these guys do other than like hug each other and hang out and sing songs. Like they, I don't even see them swimming very often. And I just thought it was really weird that these characters exist in this movie because in the context of the show, they make sense because a lot of these characters get relationships and stuff like that. But in this movie, I was thinking to myself, I feel like if you had just put two guys next door, instead of putting 15 guys next door, you could have achieved the exact same thing. And it probably would have been a little bit clearer. Yeah, it was a lot to keep up with. I mean, I, I will say I probably enjoyed those scenes maybe the most just because I thought they were like a fun group of guys and you're having a good time with them. But narratively, it didn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, but they're they did provide one of the most entertaining scenes in the entire movie which is when mech gets kidnapped on his first day and introduced to all the guys on the team in the locker room because immediately you're like what kind of movie are we about to get here let's okay can we walk through the first <laughs> few scenes because let me tell you why i had major problems with this movie right away um okay so they're swimming and coach comes up and it's like, hey, he's our new, um, he's going to train with us for three months. Why is he here? We don't know. He's just, he's here for three months. He's going to train with them. They don't tell us why. Whatever. We cut to, um, what's his name? Mech sitting in like the, sitting near the showers. And then Nam is out showering and they're like kind of tied together. Like Mech's going to stay with Nam. So he's kind of the only one that he knows there. And then Nam goes, hey, can you get me a towel? Hey, I don't want to have to ask again. Get me a towel. And then we go from that line to a straight cut. And it's, you hear, it's a black student. You hear, mm, mm, like someone's like muffled screaming. And then like hands open up. And it's like, oh, I guess Mech got kidnapped to be a, still in the locker room. <laughs> and the guys are just like, telling him everything he needs to know about Nam for some reason. Mm -hmm. And that was the opening scenes. And I was like, these three scenes have nothing to do with each other. And we're not connected <laughs> at all. Like, at all. <laughs> it was just, we don't see Mech get taken away. Nothing. Like, it's just, he's just kidnapped the next shot. And you're like, I had no idea that was going on in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was very disconnected. But it also was like, very intro to a porn movie-esque because when they kidnap him and they remove the hands from his eyes, everyone's standing there with towels wrapped around their waist. Then all of a sudden they all take their towels off and they're all in Speedos. And they're like, this is Jim and Bobby, their husband and wife. This is Keith and Stan, their roommates. And it's like, it's a lot to take in, but we're, the camera is at crotch level. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to like- High level. Yeah, so we're like all trying to like look at everybody and take everybody in, but also dicks in our faces. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot. And at first, when I first watched this movie, because I watched it before Mason watched it, I was like, okay, is this going to be one of those like porn with plot type of things or is this going to be a movie? And honestly, I'm really surprised that this movie didn't have more kind of like skinshipy moments because that scene implies that there's going to be a lot of flesh going on and outside of 
the one main character, people pretty much stay in their clothes this whole movie. It is weird that they don't swim often too. Yeah. Like it's called Waterboy, they're on the swim team, but like they don't swim ever. Yeah, like they <laughs> barely swim. Even the one character, his dad lives on the beach. The only time anybody yes. goes in the water on the beach is when the dad's boyfriend goes in the water in his boxers. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. You know what I wanted to happen? So you know the scene where Nam runs, out, runs away from the birthday party? Um, so he runs out of the birthday party and he's running down the beach. And I, for a minute, was like, wow, I really hope he jumps into that water and they go full mermaid. Like he just turns into a mermaid and swims. <laughs> That's the movie I want to see. <laughs> That's not the movie again. I just want to see it. Please. It doesn't happen, but the whole time I was like, <laughs> oh, no, that didn't happen. So I guess let's, I would like to go by relationship. Normally we'd go by character, but I think going by relationship makes more sense with this movie because so many people are kind of intertwined. So I want to start with the relationship that, to me, I was kind of the most intrigued about because I, I have a personal stake in it, um, but also just, I don't know, it felt very real because it was so messy. And it's the relationship between Nam and his dad and his dad's boyfriend. Mm -hmm. I almost wish the movie was more, was about that more, you know? Yeah. Instead of like these ancillary side stories, I'm like, no, this is interesting. Like, let's get into this. Yeah. Because so, dad is old. How old is his dad? Like, he looks so, like Tom Spiderwebs. I'm surprised he has a little boy. So, the dad to me looks like he might be in his late 50s, early 60s, and might be somebody who just grayed prematurely. But if I had to guess, I'd say 60s. I'm going to say he's in his 60s. He's got to be in his 60s, because my parents are in their late 50s, and they don't look like that. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm 41, and I look pretty old, so I feel like age is, depends on what you're I disagree. I, had, I thought you were in your 30s until you told me you were 40. Oh, well, there you go. I'm, I'm 41, guys. <laughs> but the dad, let's say the dad is in his 60s, and maybe his youngest son was like a surprise baby that him and his wife did not expect. Um, so we get the, we infer through conversations, because there's a lot of inferences, not a lot of tells. We infer through conversations that the mother of Nam and Tale has passed away. We don't know what she died of. We don't know how she died. We just know that she's gone. Mm -hmm. And the father, I guess, looking for love because he's getting older and didn't want to be alone. He ends up in a relationship with a man named Karn. Now, Karn if we told you the dad was in his 60s, how old do you think that Karn would be? You might assume Karn would be in his 40s or 50s. No, 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 no. Karn looks to be maybe five years older than Nam. Yeah, he's in like his mid to late, late 20s at the latest. Yes. Like, I'm and going he's like five, maybe. Yeah, like definitely 20s. And Karn is not like some weird looking guy. Karn is beautiful. Yeah. Nice yeah, hot. Karn's actually hot. And so this puts a lot of friction between Nam and his father. I mean, the friction, number one, because Nam is probably still grieving over his mother being gone. He's probably yeah. having a hard time accepting that his dad is in a new relationship and that this person is being a surrogate mother to his younger brother. But then also his dad is in a gay relationship with a guy who looks to be his own age. And those are a lot of layers to try to tackle at one time. Yeah. So a lot of the movie is spent with Nam being outwardly hostile to his dad and his dad kind of not knowing what to do to repair the relationship. On the one hand, his son matters to him a lot and he loves his son. He never tries to like put his relationship before his child, but he also is like, I am also a person and I deserve to have a relationship, I deserve to be loved, and your problem with who my partner is shouldn't keep me from having the partner that I have. I shouldn't have to throw them away to make you happy. Right. 
Yeah. And so their relationship, I found very complex. And I think I have to give credit where credit is due. The actor that plays Nam does a really good job of like giving you all those emotions and they're not like super spiky. Like he doesn't go into like, yeah, he's not like super like, I hate you dad. And then like, dad, I love you so much. Like he very, he very kind of, he's smooth with it. I don't know how else to say it. Like it was good. It, yeah. Yeah. It feels very organic the way that they relate to each other. Even when the dad is in the hospital and he's had this motorbike accident, their kind of reconciliation or understanding of each other was a very kind of, it was tense because it deserved to be tense because it had been tense all along. But it's kind of like, even in the midst of this tension, we're getting closer to an understanding. Yeah. And I really, really really like that. That and the dinner scene that they had afterwards were, I think two of the best scenes, just because emotionally they really did hit. Like it's not a super emotional movie, but you, you really do feel for both of those characters at that point, you know? When the dad comes home and sees that his son is like, hey, I cooked dinner, let's eat, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought that was very sweet. My one question, and I could have like zoned out, I could have missed this, fill me in Sam, what the fuck happened to Karn? Because I remember seeing him he was talking with Nam, and Nam was like, hey, make sure to take care of my dad, okay? And Karn was like, you got it, man. And then, like, you never see him again, and it kind of seems like they broke up, maybe? Or, like, okay. Karn was avoiding the dad, and I was like, did I miss, like, a line or something? Okay, I think that Karn broke up with the dad. You didn't miss anything, but there's, there's a key, I think, in a couple of different smaller scenes that lets us know that maybe Karn is not going to be there. So the one key is when Karn is filming his body hair removal video, he's on the phone with somebody and you get the feeling that the conversation he's having with this person on the phone is someone that he might be romantically interested in, which Mm -hmm. is weird because he's living with the dad. And so that already is one thing. And then, the dad is, of course, having a hard time sleeping the night of Talay's birthday, the younger brother, because, you know, him and his son have had this falling out. And Karn is like, go with me on the beach. And they go to the beach and Karn is frolicking in the water and the dad is like, not. And so you can see there that there's like some tension. There's a possibility that Karn's found somebody new. And also Karn, I guess, is looking for the dad to give him more, more buy-in into the relationship. But where it really seems to me like Karn has made up his mind that, you know, this is probably not going to work out is when Nam goes back to the house and Karn is coming out of the bathroom and they have this very awkward and weird interaction because it feels like Karn is trying to hit on Nam. Yes, because he like in really close. Yeah. It was weird. Yeah. Yeah. It was really uncomfortable, but like Nam asked, like, you know, why do you want my dad or why are you with my dad? And Karn's like, you know, I've dated all kinds of guys, younger, older, same age. I just like what I like, but it doesn't mean it's going to last forever. And I think that Karn is just one of those people that you meet in life who kind of just goes with the flow, but Mm -hmm. leaves a lot of like, leaves a trail of like broken things behind them. Mm. yeah because like Karn I'm sure that in the moment that he was like we're gonna bring your son home we're establishing a family he probably meant that absolutely but also he's probably like I like what I like and if I stop liking something I move on to the next thing that I like and Mm. that's a really difficult person to put feelings behind especially if you're like the dad who's coming out of a very committed relationship that only ended because of the death of a partner and they've got this other person like I don't I don't work that way just because I'm with you now doesn't mean I have the intention of being with you forever Mm -hmm. I'm just with you as long as it feels right and when it stops feeling right I'm gone right so that whole that whole set of relationships I could watch an entire movie about that. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Because, I mean, as a parent, and that's why I said a a personal investment, as a parent who has an ex, a lot of times I think about, like, what would would my next relationship do to impact what goes on between me and my child? Like, 
Would they be comfortable with that person? What kind of limits would I put on their interactions with them? Decision-making wise, would I feel comfortable being them doing disciplinarian actions? All that kind of comes into your mind. So like the dad's conflict read very real because you could see him like, I want you to have a role in this family, but I also don't want to lose my family but try, between trying to give you this role in the family. Mm-hmm. So like, like the best, the best kind of, I guess probably the best scene on all this tension is when they were talking about the colleague of the dad whose daughter lives in Bangkok, I guess, and the son and Karn were arguing over it. And finally Karn like pulls out his phone, like, is this her? Like you could see that they were kind of trying, not necessarily meaning to one up each other, but trying to prove their value in front of the dad. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just, I don't know. I thought that that was, that whole thing was very well acted and very emotional. And if I had seen more of that in this movie and maybe less of some of the other stuff, I would have been highly satisfied. Yeah. But the other thing that I found really interesting, and there was not enough explanation about it throughout the movie for me to kind of get where it comes from. There's a scene fairly early on where the dad is sitting on a bench in the locker room across from the showers, and Nam is showering, and he asks Nam, are you still dating girls? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of scenes with Nam where it's very clear that he is questioning his sexuality. And it makes me wonder, like, is that also a part of that conflict between him and his dad? Is like his dad is dating a man. He's conflicted about his own sexuality. So maybe having to confront that with his dad is very difficult. Also, the fact that, you know, his dad was married to his mother for years. And so like, were you gay the whole time? Did you just become gay? Were you lying to my mother? Like the sexuality of both men is a big sore spot between them. Right. So I, 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 I would like, I, again, coming into the middle, the movie feels like coming into the middle of a conversation. What was it that Nam had done that caused his dad to ask him, are you still dating girls? Mm-hmm. So. Maybe it's just because he thinks that him and Mac were getting kind of close, you know? I don't know. I don't That's know. The problem with this movie. Shit's just <laughs> weird. Yeah, it's just like, it's just out there and you're expected to kind of understand what the hell's going on without being told. Okay, so now I guess we should talk about Nam and Mac and just the fucking roller coaster whirlwind that is these two together. These two gave me a headache. You just don't know where you stand with them. Like, I want them to be together, but they're like both dumb boys. And like, because they're both dumb boys, it interferes with their relationship, you know? Like, they went like Mm -hmm. three months without talking, you know? And it's like, they had each other's phone number. (laughs) They could have just texted. No, they didn't have each other's phone number. Yes, they did, because the last scene is him calling Mac, is Nam calling Mac, and he hears the phone ringing in his dorm room that he just walked into. No, no, you got that twisted. Mac called Nam, Nam's phone rang, and I guess he missed the call, so he called the call back, and it rang in the dorm room. But initially, wow. he had Noon's number, because remember, Jenny was sitting next to Noon, and she's like, you told him that was Mech's number. Why'd you give him your number? Uh Uh-huh. So for the longest time, Nam didn't even have Mech's number. Mm. It just, how did Mech get Nam's number and then just give it, just call? I think that Mech always had Nam's number because Mech's father used to call Mech on Nam's phone because Mech had left his phone in Bangkok. So Mech has always had... Yeah, so Mech has always had Nam's number, but, but Nam did not have Mech's number. But why did he wait a few months to call or text him? I don't know. Like Mech the, is... The fight made no sense, because they were both like, we like each other. Let's never speak again. It's like, why? It's ah. Mech. Like, honestly, if it, all come, if it all boils down to who is the problem in this relationship, it is Mech. Mech is the problem. Mech is cute. But Mech's not cute enough to go through the bullshit headache that he puts people through. Mech looks like baby Om. 
Neck is incredibly beautiful. Uh, he you look like baby is, <laughs> And you like Ohm. Listen, I'm not going to lie to you. He's actually older than Ohm, which is hilarious. Um, but he is very fine. He's very fine. But I think what Ohm has that this kid doesn't is that Ohm is a better actor, number one. <laughs> but number two, like, Ohm's face comes across a lot friendlier, whereas this kid, his acting, he comes across very confused. Hmm. So... If I was reading that script, I'd be confused too. Yeah, well, he <laughs> lets the confusion show on his face. Uh, I think that the actor who plays Nam does a much better job of, like, yeah. making the material work. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, Nam and Mech, when they first meet, Nam is like, he's not a brat like that's the thing that also is very something they did with this movie that i really appreciate because you never see this in like movies where the parent and the children have problems usually in a movie like this if the dad introduces a new character and says you're going to stay with this new character if the dad and the child are having problems the child will be mean to the new character and be like i hate you my dad forced me to live with you nom's not like that at all from like day one he's like cool we live together we're friends and immediately we're like really close friends and I want to hang out with you all the time. And it's just very interesting, like how Nam kind of melts into Mech so very quickly. And Mech doesn't seem to do anything to make Nam believe that it's not reciprocated. Right. Like right away, when Nam and Mech first meet, we have them like meeting at the pool then they have the locker room scene where we talked about the swim team, like kidnapping him, blindfold, whatever. Then they go to this, the room that they're going to be sharing. Met cleans the room. And there's a little bit of a disagreement about uh, cleaning the room because like, I can't find my stuff. But then like after Nam sees that Mech doesn't make it a big deal that he has some male on male pornography in his porn stash, it's like all of a sudden Nam's like, okay, well, we're gonna be friends. We are gonna go get drunk together. I'm gonna hold you and make sure you're kept warm in blankets. We're gonna sleep on the same bed. Like Nam is totally like, this is my little buddy. I love him. But then, then we have the kind of, I guess, I don't wanna say acknowledgement, but like at some point the feelings change from you're gonna be my little buddy to I'm starting to get a boner around you. And there's a couple of times where like Nam gets very clear boners in front of Mech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like there's one time where they're like, they're in the rain and they go back to the dorm room and they go into the bathtub to take off their wet clothes and Mech looks down and Nam is like on hard. And there's this elephant sound that happens. <laughs> he sees it, and I don't know why. I, I think it's because they both have giant dicks, and then they <laughs> were awkward about it. I guess so, which I, I, I would like to see it. Because there were, like, like two it. elephant noises, so I was like, oh, they both noticed that that <laughs> <Jack> monster dick. <laughs> <laughs> so they have that, and then, like, there's another scene where they wake up, and Nam realizes that, like, He's on hard and he goes to grab his stuff and goes into the bathroom. So they both kind of realize like their bodies are responding to each other. So then they get the invitation to go to Chiang Mai to go to a swimming competition. And it's some of the little bit of swimming we actually see in this fucking movie. They go to Chiang Mai and Nam gets sick because I guess he's, I don't guess afraid of airplanes, but maybe airplanes make him nauseous. I'm not sure what the deal is. And so, Mech does the thing that they do in every single Thai boys love I've ever watched. Get out the bowl with the warm water and start wiping somebody down. Mm -hmm. Which I have to ask, if anybody knows anyone in Thailand, is that a regular occurrence? Do people randomly wipe down strangers? I think it's only close people you're close with. I guess so, because like we see a lot of that. And I, I just have to ask, but I digress. He goes to wipe down Nam and he's taken off all of Nam's clothes. And at this point, Nam is in the bed with no underwear, just a towel over his waist. And Mech is like, 
internal conflict, decides to clean Nam's genitals. Mm -hmm. And Nam wakes up from his nauseous sleep and he's like, are you cleaning my dick? He literally says that. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, I, I, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, you're like, okay, so Nam isn't the only one having these reactions. Obviously, Mech is too. And it looks like Mech is getting ready to jump in into maybe exploring this a little further. All of a sudden, Mech's girlfriend shows up. And I was so mad when we find out who Mech's girlfriend is because I'm like, you're a fucking liar. And you're a cheat, and you should have been honest. Because Mech's girlfriend shows up in Chiang Mai. First, how did she know he was going to be in Chiang Mai? Secondly, like, what the fuck is she doing there? Thirdly, when we first go into the bedroom of Nam at the dorms, he has a huge poster over his bed of this girl. And Mech is like, do you like that girl? He's like, yeah, she's my ideal type. The girl is Mech's girlfriend, who is a model celebrity person. Why wouldn't you tell him that's who it is? Mech's whole thing is like, it's none of your business. It, it's my privacy. Mm -hmm. It kind of is a little bit. Like, you don't have to necessarily be like, you know, and we fuck five times a week. But you can be like, hey, that girl you have on your wall, that's actually my girlfriend. And like, there's a couple pictures of us together. That's all you have to do. It doesn't have to be a big thing. Because he does at one point tell Nam, I have a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. But Mech doesn't have his phone with him. He's not asking to borrow a phone in order to call his girlfriend all the time. We're not sure how long they've been living together. But in the whole time they're living together, he never talks to his girlfriend. So of course, Nam's going to be like, you probably don't actually have a girlfriend. But then all of a sudden his girlfriend shows up in Chiang Mai and she's all over Mech and she's like, oh, Mech, we're such great friends. I love you. You're the best boyfriend ever. And Mech is like, oh, this bitch. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, what is your, what is this relationship between Mech and Nun? What was your relationship like before he went to this swim team? And why are y'all, what is going on here? It was weird. And then like after like and then they like went to a bar and she was all over nam and i was like right trying to break them up right like what's going on with you girl and then she sees them like cuddling that night and then she proceeds to like travel with them honestly every scene she was in i was like what are we doing here why are we here why is this important who is she why did she need to be introduced how did she know where they were it was weird and it's also, I wanted to like, light her on fire. Yeah, no, she sucks. So it's also like, girl, <laughs> you're really cute and famous, and that dude sucks. Like, you can find better dick. Absolutely. Like, she's like trying to ruin the, what they, uh, like the budding relationship that they have, where she's like, oh, he clearly like doesn't like me anymore, and is into this guy. She's like actively trying to wreck them. Or whatever reason you know yeah wow. it's just i don't understand it like mech is outwardly hostile to this girl there's times when she tells him like a real boyfriend would do this and he's like yeah and like he wouldn't even respond with nothing or like he'd wait till it was too late to do that like they're drinking at a table in chiang mai and she's like can you pour me a drink and he's like okay She's like, a real boyfriend wouldn't want me to drink because they wouldn't want me to get drunk. Well, she gets drunk, and then he goes, are you sure you want a drink? It's like, Mech, what? What? Too late, sir. Too little too late. And that I mean. ended, um, Nam was like, oh, you know, she's drunk. You should, like, wipe her down. And mm -hmm. Mech is like, nah, I only do that for people I feel close to. <laughs> and she's sitting, yeah, there, and it's like she's sitting there plucked, like, that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really was like, what the fuck? So Nam, bless his heart. I, I love Nam. The guy who plays Nam plays Nam in a very sympathetic way. Nam is very clear to Mech, like, I'm interested in you. I don't know what the deal is with you and your girlfriend. I'm not going to break you and your girlfriend up, but I am interested in you. Like, at the club... Uh, Met goes to the bathroom and Nam follows him to the bathroom 
and they have like an argument and then Nam just starts kissing Max. Mm-hmm. And I was watching that scene thinking, this feels right. This is a nasty place to do this, but this feels right. Mm-hmm. But Mac is just like, yeah, we can kiss, we can hug, but I'm not gay. She's still my girlfriend. I don't like her. I don't treat her nice, but she's still my girlfriend, whatever. And it's like, Mac, can you just, can you just, just tell us what's going on. Just tell us what you want. He sucked Pick for a that. Side. She sucked for, honestly, she should have left him. Like, I don't know why she couldn't have broken up with him. You know? Yes. And then she finally, like, decides that she doesn't want to be with Mech and shows up to Nam's father's bedside in the hospital and is like, yeah, yes. he's my boyfriend now. What the fuck was that about? Oh, my God. The dad's in the hospital. They go to the hospital homegirls there i'm like how the fuck did you get here before they did <laughs> like, yeah, like, what are you doing here this is weird yeah and, and then that, have... like yes this girl can just be in my hospital bed <laughs> yeah and so she's like he's my boyfriend now and so <laughs> nam rightfully nam drags them both out says like the fuck is going on? What are you doing here? What is going on between you two? Why are you dragging me and my dad into this? And she's like, well, obviously Mech doesn't like me anymore. So I'm going to go out with you because you're available. And I'm torn because like you were saying, early on, she was flirting with Nam very, very hard. So I couldn't tell if she was interested in Nam because she was actually interested in Nam or if she was trying to get Nam to be with her to stick it to Mech. Yeah, I think it was a stick it to Mac thing. Yeah, so now I'm just like, you two need to figure out your shit and leave me alone. And Mac being the bitch boy that he is like, well, then fuck you. I'm going back to Bangkok because I don't need this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but he tells him he likes him first. He's like, by the way, I have a crush on you. But fuck you. <laughs> right! Please. And Mac is, and not... And I was like, my dad's in the hospital. Like, I can't deal with this right now. Yeah, like, my dad's dying. Like, can y'all just, like, (laughs) pack this up? (laughs) And then, like, okay. He just goes back home. Why did he, why was, they literally never told us why he went there in the first place. Was it, like, some, was it, like, apparently a really good swim team? They got that swim scholarship. But, oh, my God, that swim scholarship was literally, like, when they got the envelopes, they were like, oh, we got into this swimming race or whatever. I was like, I didn't know you were trying to go for a swimming race. <laughs> it just, I mean, it literally came out of nowhere. They were like, we're going to and, like, and I was like, I didn't realize that was a goal of yours. And then they move into dorms at the end of the movie. And the schools they were in before, I said at the beginning of our vlog that I thought it was a high school. But I think their sweatshirt said like Ocean College. So did they go from a college to a university? Like, and no. I'm assuming that. But he said, remember that there was also, okay, there's a small plot line where a guy asks Nam to like tutor him. And he's like. That's oh, right. Oh, I'm in grade 12 and you're in grade 10. So I think they are seniors in high school, but they were drinking a lot. So like, what's the drinking age in Thailand? Um, right. Arms for high school? I don't know, like that's not a thing in America, so I'm a little confused. And then also, yeah. Let's small, small digression. That kid in the 10th grade who was asking to learn how to swim, when he does the homework for Nam and then just kisses Nam and Nam starts like punching him. Wailing, wailing on him. I was like, the hell is going on here? And it never gets oh, addressed yeah. again. Oh, yeah. It was like, ooh. Okay. That happened. Like, on the one hand, I could get the first hit. Because and you the first kissed one. me. Yeah, yeah the first one. Kiss. Yes. The other ones just felt like some homophobic shit. Like, he was like, I'm not ready to deal with this, ho. Pop, pop. Like, it was like, ooh, you don't need to come back for more. The one with yeah. the house. <laughs> <laughs> and like the guy's in his dad's house, I think. So like what? And then 
he acts this way towards this kid, but with him and Mac, it's like, whenever you want to do anything, let me know. And it's just, it's so, (laughs) yeah, it's so confusing. It's, it's incredibly confusing. But finally, in the end, uh, Mech and Nam have kind of just settled into life without each other, I guess. And they both go off to college. And as they're both going to the Love by a Chance Tharn type dormitory, they end up, uh, Nam ends up in a room, a dorm room. He receives a phone call, misses the phone call, calls it back. And he hears the phone ringing in the dorm room. And As he's following the sound of this other phone ringing while he's calling somebody, he sees a familiar backpack. And then out of the bathroom comes Mech. And they make up. They share a hug. And Mech is kind of crying a little bit, like, you know, I've missed you and I like you. And that's pretty much the end of the movie. But like, so many questions. Where where are y'all? Number one, I know you're at the Love by Chance Tharn type dormitory. It looked very familiar, but like, where are y'all really? Number two, like, Nam, don't you have a ton of questions for Mech about like, why didn't you call me this whole time? How do we end up being roommates? Like, the fuck is going on here? Number three, Mech, don't you have a lot to explain about that whole situation with Noon and everything that went on prior to now and why you haven't called? just it's it's so unsettled and even like during the closing credits they have like a little weird vignette with jenny and noon and her trying to get another boyfriend or whatever it's weird it, it doesn't really do anything for the plot but like noon i have so many questions for you what was your relationship like with mech before he went to the swim team why did you accept him being the world's worst boyfriend why were you fighting so hard to keep the world's worst boyfriend why did you think that it would be a cool idea to try to get in between these two what did mech do that made you both love and hate him so intensely and noon you are a celebrity girl people recognize you when you walk down the street they ask you for photographs and autographs is there no one in the entire hemisphere of Thai celebrity that you could latch on to besides this loser boy like it did there's so much stuff that's unresolved at the end of this thing and like mason said early on what happened to karn i mean we kind of know what kind of person karn is in a way but still where did he land did the dad ever find anybody else? You know, it's just this this movie needed to be a television show. I can see why the people who made this movie were like, it would be a good idea for this to be turned into a television show because there's a lot of territory that needs exploration here. Yeah, they really just should have picked maybe one thing and did that for the movie instead of like, well, we have 10 ideas, so we'll just make this a confusing mess. But let me tell you something. I kind of understand why this turned out the way it did in terms of being like a whole bunch of stuff going on and not knowing what the hell is going on because the company that made this movie made why, why, why. Okay. And I think that that's just their thing is that when they make shows, a bunch of shit happens and it has no explanation. That's just, they live in chaos. The problem with that with this show is the tone for this was much more serious than YYY. And YYY was so over the top and cartoonish that I was okay with it. Whereas Mm -hmm. this one was, it felt like they were trying to actually go for something a bit more natural, a bit more realistic. Like it wasn't a funny movie, you know, I'd call it a drama more than anything. So that type of storytelling doesn't work with a serious drama. I agree. I think tone wise, it wasn't great like to do all this when you're trying to have a serious tone. But I really do think that the people behind this company, they just have so many ideas and they try to fit so much stuff in at one time. And it's like, no, you have to learn how to let your story breathe. Sometimes you can't do everything in one storyline. You just have to like pull it out or at the very minimum, if this movie did not have the noon character at all, if there was nothing to do with her, if it was just, will we, won't we, because I'm struggling to figure out my sexuality and you're waiting for me to tell you where you stand with me and put that on the backside of the father-son drama, this movie would have been way better. Really Everything that happens with Noon just throws this movie off. Yeah, they could have cut her entirely 
Ugh, they really should have killed some babies. Um, that's how you yeah. do it. You know, I mean, there's a lot of times at work where, like, I'll be reading the updated script or something, and I'm like, oh, that joke got cut. But it's like, for a timing reason or for whatever reason, like, things that you like sometimes get cut. Scenes I've worked on get cut. It sucks. It sucks to put, like, you know, two weeks of work into something, and then ultimately they got to cut it. But it's for the betterment of the show and for the project. So, yeah, your babies, you got to learn, got to be okay with it. Mm -hmm. So this brings me to just a little brief aside that I wanted to talk about. And I'm asking the people who watch our channel to give me more information. So the company that made this movie is a company called Cosa Como. And Cosa Como is super familiar to me because I am a big fan of the show Make It Right. And in season two of Make It Right, they were all wearing Cosa Como sweaters. And so Cosa Como has had a hand in Make It Right, Make It Right 2, Love Sick, which there was a poster of Love Sick at the, in the movie. Uh, they had a hand in Love Sick 2, Nern, who plays Nam was in both of the Love Six. Um, they also are the company behind YYY. They also had a hand in producing Why Are You? And I just want to know like the history of this company. They changed their name from Cosa Como to Copy A Bangkok. Don't know why, have no explanation for it. But I really would like to know more about this company and like who runs this company, why this company is involved in the things that they're involved in because it seems like this company behind the scenes is like the originator of our current Thai boys love landscape because Love Sick and Make It Right were huge before we ever had anything to do with Love by Chance being a thing. But people don't really talk about Love Sick and Make It Right very much because they're very hard to access legally. I think Love Sick might be on Netflix. I'm not sure about Make It Right. And because those series came out, I want to say like five, six years ago, they just don't get talked about the same way Love by Chance and some of the other stuff does. But I'm very interested to know more about Cosa Como and kind of like their motivations and where they are behind the scenes. Because it seems like they've had a hand in a lot of what makes current boys love. And this movie was like them workshopping how they were going to move forward with their projects. Mm -hmm. But that was just a small tangent. If anybody has any insights they can offer with that, I'd love to hear about it in the comment section. I think I'm ready to go to the ranking because I can't think of anything else that I really needed to talk about with this movie. I'm ready to rank. Okay, so we talked a bit about ranking before our conversation. And with me, I'm just going to say I'm giving this to six and a half. And the reason I'm giving this a six and a half is because I spent a lot of time talking about how much I was invested in the story between mom and his father. So to me, that's very valid and it deserves a score. And also, I just really like the actor that plays Nam. There's something very, I don't know how to say it, like friendly is not the word. There's something very intriguing about him. It's something about the way he looks, about the way he acts, that I just want to know more about that kid. I want to see more things with him in it. And so I think him and then the father's storyline were a big part in why I went ahead and I gave this a 6.5. But probably if I had to put Mech and Noon and all that mess into the conversation, I probably would go down another half a point because I hated that. But I, I really, really loved Nam and, and all the things around Nam that were within his control. And he's a character that if I could clean up this script any, I would love to see a movie just around him as a character. Same actor and everything, but I just want to know more about him. I'm going to give this a two. I thought it was <laughs> really poorly done in literally every way besides maybe the acting. Like the writing was bad, the editing was bad, it made no sense, it was not good. Um, however, if I were to have like a bad movie night with friends and we were drinking, this is a movie I'd suggest we watch. Really? Like, Not I, Red Wine in the Dark Knight? No, I think that one's a little too slow and boring in mm -hmm. some ways. Like, not a lot happens in that movie. 
Whereas this one, like, this one just breakneck pace. It just, it's going at full throttle all the way. Um, I even love, like, little aside characters, like the kooky, the kooky lady riding the motorcycle at the end. Like, I love her. her. I would love, I would, I would watch an entire fucking show about crazy lady with the motorcycle. Like, please, Thailand, I'm here. I'll watch it. (laughs) So that's what that movie is for me. Is this, this isn't a good movie, but boy, man, take an edible, get some, get something to eat. You're going to have a great night. That's my pitch. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Um, And I just have to talk a little bit about the guy who plays Nam. His name is Nern. I love him. I love him so very much. You all know I fall in love with actors. And when I do, I'm tender about it. Number one, his body is amazing. Like a lot of times we get these shows where people are supposed to be on the swim team or the soccer team and they do not look like they could ever possibly play that sport at an elite level because their bodies just aren't there his body is there we spend a lot of time getting to look at that body his body is there Mm -hmm. but not just that i really have to hand it to him if he was not in this movie if there was anyone less capable this movie would be unwatchable yeah. It would absolutely be unwatchable. And to me, that's a sign of a killer. And it makes me really want to see him in more projects, see more stuff that he does. And I just really hope that his projects start getting translated into English. He doesn't do as much BL stuff as everybody else does because he's not signed to GMM or Wasabi or any of those kind of things. I think he works for Channel 131. Um, but I really hope that I get to see him in more stuff because he made this experience for me. No one else could have done it. So I love you, Nern. Your Instagram of the week. I think you already know. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I gave the game away. Um, but my Instagram of the week is Nern. <laughs> it's spelled N G E R N N N. And He's got a lot of pictures and I'm just going to say this now because he doesn't photograph well. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Face wise, he does not photograph well. He's not, he's not an Instagram person that I think a lot of you would be really interested in, but he does post about his new projects on his Instagram. Um, and he's got a great body and I like him. So I request that you follow him. Now the other actor that played Mech, He's actually really pretty. Like he does look a lot like Ohm, but like a skinnier, not as buff Ohm, maybe a little bit deeper tan. Um, His Instagram is the beam is here. So it's T-H-E-B-E-A-M-I-S-H-E-R-E. The beam is here. And he actually has a pretty thriving acting career. He was in a Netflix movie called, or series called The Stranded with Perk from Love by Chance. Um, yeah, so, uh, and he was also in The Gifted, I think, okay. which is another really popular one. So, like, his, I think, career is going places, which is why it's very surprising to me that he doesn't have that many followers. Like, I mean, he's got way more followers than I'll ever see in my lifetime, but, like, Beam, who plays Mech, has 142,000 followers. Nern, who played Nam, has 430,000 followers. Oh, wow. I know it's surprising because it seems like Beam is doing a lot more mainstream stuff, but I don't know. You know, sometimes it's just a matter of not being a good actor. That sometimes makes the difference. Um, And then I have a surprise Instagram of the day for you. This is the Instagram of Luke Voyage. Uh, I think he's going by the name Luke Plowden in Thailand right now, but his Instagram is Luke Voyage. It's L U K E. V O Y A G E. Was he in and there? no, he has nothing to do with this. That's oh, why it's a like, surprise. I follow him, but I don't remember seeing him. <laughs> no, 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 no. He wasn't in this at all. So I, I'm totally misleading you guys. I decided to make him um, part of my Instagram of the day because there are no projects in the foreseeable future that he will be involved in that we will be talking about on this show. But his Instagram, I find very enjoyable he's hot (laughs) he's he is he's hot and he hangs out with his hot friends with no clothes yeah 
particularly one hot friend who he hasn't done any pictures on Instagram with for a, a while now, but he and Joss from Free Will Be Free are big friends. And they do, you know, things that bro friends do, like work out together in just shorts and like hang out in the kitchen together in just shorts and like eat food together in just shorts and maybe feed each other in just shorts. And I find that it brightens my day whenever I'm feeling a little blue. So I thought I would give you just some pure man candy for today's Instagram of the day. So you've got the two lead actors from Waterboy and then you've got Luke Voyage, who's just who just exists to be a smile on your face. Yes. Samantha's rant. This is not Samantha's rant, but I do want to talk about this just because I feel like it's very important for us to talk about considering what it is we do on this show. Uh, we review boys loves from around Asia. We do Japan, we do Thailand, we do the Philippines, we do Taiwan. And recently in both the Philippines and Thailand, there have been a number of political movements happening. And I think that as a community that enjoys the output of these actors, we should also be cognizant and aware of the political climate that they're making these movies and these films under and try at the very least to have some awareness of what's going on. Even if there's really nothing that we can do, we still need to have awareness. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna to talk to you very briefly about what's going on in the Philippines. In the Philippines, they passed a few months ago something called the Junk Terror Bill. And the Terror Bill basically allows the Philippines to lock you up if they think that you are committing any form of international or domestic terrorism. Now, they don't have to have proof. They can have a suspicion and lock you up. Meaning that if you say that you don't like the president of the Philippines on Facebook, they can come to your house and they can lock you up. If you are LGBTQIA plus and you decide to say, I think that the Philippines treats us unfairly, you can be seen as a traitor to the state. They can come to your house, they can lock you up. Um, and recently, a lady who spoke out against what was going on, the political climate, she was locked up and has been in jail for many, many months. At the time that she was locked up, she was pregnant. And she gave birth to a child that was born ill, that the baby was, was sickly to begin with. And after a month of allowing her to breastfeed, they took the baby away, even though the baby was still doing poorly, and the baby ended up dying at three months. And uh, they did allow her to attend the funeral for the child, but they didn't let her see the child in the hospital when the child was dying. And at the funeral, she had to attend it in handcuffs, could not touch her baby, couldn't touch anybody else. No one could touch her. And they had like, I think 20 soldiers at the funeral during this time. And then after the funeral, they took her right back to jail. And it's incredibly inhumane as a parent. I cannot imagine her pain. Um, she spoke out. She didn't do anything to anybody. She didn't hurt anybody. She just spoke out against something that she felt was unfair. And for that, she's had to endure the loss of her child and the loss of her freedom. And it's really hard for celebrities to talk about this because President Duterte has taken away the broadcast license for the world's biggest broadcast network because they said something negative about him. Um, he has shut down businesses for people who have been rivals to him or who he thinks don't support him fully. Um, thousands of people have been disappeared and killed behind the president's war on drugs in Philippines, which basically is if the police catch you with drugs, if they feel like killing you, they can. And so it's a desperate political situation in the Philippines. And it's one of the things that it doesn't get brought up when we're talking about boys love, but it's incredible that the Philippines is seeing this surge of boys love series and movies and things like that, because they're in a climate to where you could be jailed for doing this if the president decides that his next target is LGBTIAQ plus people. If he decides that gay people are the enemy, all of these actors, all of these producers, all of these directors are liable to be locked up. And it's crazy that they have to make content that's about 
allowing people to live their lives under threat of losing their own lives and their own freedoms. So that's one thing that I wanted to make sure I talked about today. The other is what's going on in Thailand right now. So in Thailand, um, people are taking to the streets and protesting because Thailand has a terrible president and a terrible dictator for a prime minister and things aren't going well. So in Thailand, um, they've always had a royal family and they had a king who was much beloved by the majority of Thailand. His name was King Bumapol. If I said it wrong, I apologize. Pronunciation is not my strong suit. Um, but he passed away, I want to say about three years ago. And the reason I remember him passing is because at the time, there was an article in Sumpi about Lisa, Bam Bam, Nikun, and a few other Thai K-pop celebrities talking about him on their Instagram because he was like the grandfather for the country. Well, the king had two sons and two daughters, I think. And he had an oldest son who everybody thought would be the next king. And that oldest son died several years ago. And so the younger son was scheduled to inherit the, the throne in Thailand. And Thailand has laws that say, you cannot say anything bad about the king. You cannot take unflattering photographs of the king. You cannot print anything that might be critical of the king. All of those things can result in you going to jail. And the new king of Thailand is awful. Um, he has married and divorced, I wanna say four or five different times, plus he keeps a, a bunch of consorts. Now, marrying and divorcing wouldn't be that big a deal if the marrying and divorcing didn't result in his wife having to flee the country with her children, him disinheriting those children, and them constantly being worried that they might lose their lives in exile. Um, he has thrown birthday parties for his dog and given his dog a military ranking so that his dog can be given a paycheck in the Thai military. He changed the laws of the country so that he didn't have to rule the country from Thailand. Instead, he can live the majority of his days in Bavaria and rule from there. Um, he, not to be too personal, he likes to parade around town in crop tops or bikini tops because he doesn't believe in wearing clothes in public. And the current situation from what I've heard in Bavaria is that it's like him and 20 different women, and he just goes around town half naked, enjoying sex orgies in Bavaria. Now, his personal dalliances would mean nothing, except for the fact that the people in Thailand have been under the rule of like a military prime minister, and it's been a lot of human rights accesses and a lot of human rights violations happening, and their king could give a fuck about them. The only thing he's concerned about is don't take an unflattering picture of me in my tank top. It's, if you're scared about America, this is the- imagine, imagine if we had laws that said you could not call Donald Trump a Cheeto. Which real talk like is scary and is on its way. So like yeah. it's scary to see like that could happen to us here too. And so the people of Thailand are fed up. They're fed up of having a king that could give a fuck about them and only cares about protecting his money and his freedom to do whatever freaky thing he wants to do. They're tired of people being scared to be opposed to the king when he's not doing right by the people, um, that he's not keeping in check the prime minister and other people that are governing the people. And so they've taken to the streets. And one of the things that I find the most inspiring about this situation and a reason why I really wanted to make sure I talked about it is that the people of Thailand have taken to doing a three-fingered salute as a part of their protest and they got it from the Hunger Games. Like literally, they got it from the Hunger Games. And this is a reason why when we're critical of art on our vlog and we talk about art, it's because art matters to people. Sometimes you can create a work that touches upon something in society that people connect with. And the fact that the people of Thailand took an American, American novel slash movie series and said, this is us, this is how we're going to protest, 
that matters. And that's also the reason why we get so mad at assholes like JK Rowling, because the same works that inspire people to feel like maybe there's a place in this world for me. When the author of that work turns it around and says, yeah, you thought, yeah, you thought it's devastating. And I know that people are going to claim death of the author, but that's very hard to do. And I think doing that is also kind of bad. And death of the author, I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of death of the author. So please don't come into the comments saying, well, death of the author, because no. And we'll not get into that here because it's not important right now. But sorry, continue on. Yeah. But they're in the streets it, with just umbrellas fighting water cannons of the Thai military as they protest. Yeah. And it's a really dangerous situation. And Tool Pacorn from Max Tall has used his social media platforms to defend the Thai people, to be on their side, to show him at the protests. And it has caused some difficulty for him. There's a lot of Boys Love Productions that are currently being postponed. A lot of sponsorships that are being taken away from actors and artists who have chosen to speak out about this. But on the flip side of that, there's a lot of people looking at Bright Wind and their silence and saying, why aren't you talking? So again, I'm not saying that you have to be out here doing anything specifically, but I do think that you should build an awareness you should understand the climate they're working in. And maybe if you have the ability, if you have a Twitter account, Instagram account, whatever you have social media wise, just, you know, retweet a, here's what's happening in the world right now. You don't have to do a lot, but if we can get more eyes on it, if we can get people internationally to start looking at this and maybe putting pressure on their governments to quit treating their people this way, it could be something amazing because the truth of the matter is me and Mason probably will never ever get to go to Thailand because Thailand has recently passed a bill saying that in order to visit them, you have to have at least 15,000 pounds in the bank and you have to show six months of bank details to prove that you've had this balance the entire six month time. So that kind of leaves me from ever going to Thailand. So I can't go there and fight with them. What a weird law to say you can't visit our country unless you're this rich, like, you know what? I know where that law comes from. It comes from white people. Let me tell you a little something. So a lot of white tourists have gone to different areas in Asia and have begun begging for money and food when they get there because it's a challenge to them to show up to a country with very little money and see if they can make it in the country until it's time for them to go home. And these countries are tired of these begging tourists. So now they're like, don't come here if you don't have money. So thank you, white people, for ruining it for the rest of us. It's what we do best. <laughs> like, I legitimately had a whole plan for going to Thailand in about three years. I was going to go for dental work. I had a plan that I was going to wait till Stephanie got out of high school. I was going to save my money. And then I was going to go to Thailand to do one of those, like, plastic surgery vacations that people do. And I was going to go and get my teeth done and come back. That's now completely off the table because I don't have the money. I just don't have them. I don't have 15,000 pounds in the bank to show them that I've got the money because pounds are actually, I think dollars aren't competitive with the pound, something like that. So it's like even more in dollars. So yeah, I'm not going and it fucking sucks. So thank you. Thank you for ruining this for me, folks. I appreciate you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so let's go to the manga of the day. So I actually have one this week. So a few weeks ago, when I kind of stopped doing manga of the day, um, I actually have read a manga. I usually buy them, I usually read them. I don't read a lot online. Um, and just like the well was running dry of what I wanted to recommend because not everything that I buy and read is good. And I bought one called Koi Monogatari. And it was terrible. I hated it. I thought it was bad. I thought the art was bad. I thought the writing was bad. It was just really messy. But for whatever reason, I was compelled to buy the sequel. <laughs> and I did it. And it honestly, the glow up is amazing. 
Um, and now I'm recommending it here because I generally think that there is some extremely interesting stuff going on in the series. Um, it's not over. I think there are three volumes total. I think volume two just came out. So volume three is on its way in English. Um, I don't have a release date for you. Um, this is interesting. And the reason there was such a glow up is because there was quite a big time jump in the, making of, in the makings of volume one and two. Because if you're like a boys love manga artist in Japan, well, that's not an extremely profitable thing unless you're doing like doujin or something like that. So a lot of them will write like boys love on the side. So it's usually published every like three months there's a new chapter of a boys love. So it takes a long time for Yaoi to get published in Japan. So it takes a long time to make these volumes. So this took three years to make. And honestly, you can really see the difference in quality, not in terms of the writing, but also the art style. Even at the beginning of this, it's, it's not great. It's not great. I'm not going to lie. But by the end, <laughs> it's pretty good. And there's some really nice, um, like, the, the, like, Comics really depends on like the organization of the panels um, and if it's clear, if it makes sense, if it's emotional, how do you build emotion through the way you stage things. Um, and this artist, I don't feel like had that yet in the first one, whereas this one they really started to get a hold of using light and shadow, texture, tone, and like really creating an atmosphere for their story, um, which is really cool. Um, However, my main gripe still is all the characters look the same and I keep getting confused um, and if they're not in their specific outfit because let's even look at the cover. Those two boys look exactly the same. Same build, same face, same, we even have like the same haircut. Just one has gray hair and one has black hair. So well, also their faces are half in shadow so it is very difficult to tell what okay. they look like. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it, I'll buy something in here. But like they, they all look the same. Um, which is just, it's hard. But the story is about Yuiji, who is the guy with black hair. And he overhears his classmate, Yamato, who he's not really friends with. He overhears that Yamato is gay. And he, for whatever reason, is almost enticed by this. Like, he's kind of like, I've never met a queer before. This is interesting. Like, I want to see what that's like. So they end up becoming friends. And the story basically kind of divulges from there. And it basically becomes about how Yamato is an extremely, he has a lot of internalized homophobia because it's Japan and he can't really be out yet. And how he slowly does come out to some friends and it's kind of a hard read for me because there was a lot of the calls coming from inside the house moments for me where I was like, <laughs> like a little too, a little too serious for me in a triggering way. Um, like there's literally a line where he's like, it's very interesting that people are accepting of me because the one that accepts me the least is me. And I was like, <sighs> that's what I say to myself. <laughs> This isn't fun anymore. This feels like a read. <laughs> <laughs> but it's how we, you know, and this one kind of ends with Yamato kind of has a crush on his straight best friend now. So I don't know if they'll get together. I don't know if that's what this is going to be about. And I'm kind of, a, I'd be okay with it if they don't get together because when I was, when I, you know, had a major crush on my straight best friend we didn't get together so it's more true to life that they wouldn't get together maybe we'll yeah. see with volume three but volume two was really good and it's worth the slog that volume one might feel like so mm -hmm. that's called koi monogatari it's a long japanese word i don't have the english translation um and it is by toru tagura um if i remember i'll leave it in the comments because this one has a long time Okay. And it's published by Tokyo Pop in America. Yay! Okay. So guys, next week, we're watching a show that is very hard to get your hands on. I wish I could give you a clue as to where to watch it, but I mean, 
I have found it on Daily Motion sometimes. I have found it on Facebook sometimes. But the show we're going to watch is He is Coming to Me. Yay. He's, I just want to let you guys know now, um, much like Make Our Days Count, it may be one of those times where it's just really us gushing about our faves. Yeah. But <laughs> as, as, Mace, as Mason mentioned earlier, Om Pawat is my fave. I love he. Singto is also one of my faves. I love he. My faves are in a couple in this show. And the show is not a bad show. I am completely <laughs> invested. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I just want you to know it's going to be hardcore simping hours. And I need you to understand that before you even come into the comment section. Because you're like, you're not this critical on others. Listen, I don't want to hear that. I'm just letting you know now that this is a joy to watch. This is for me. Please understand, support me in my simping. Because... I, I, I fucking love this show. This is one of the few shows that if there was a box set that had English subs, I would be tempted to buy. And I don't buy shows. I don't. But this is one of the few shows that I think I would actually be tempted to buy because I love this show. And also, I'm afraid of it disappearing from the internet forever. So, yeah, this, this is a special, special show to me. And a show that I did not think was going to work. After the first couple episodes, I'm like... Ha, ha. Me either. Yeah. It's so good, it's a good show. So we're excited. It is. So please look for He Is Coming to Me. It is a show by GMM TV, even though it does not exist on their YouTube channel. It stars Om Pawat and Sinkto from Sodas. And um, like I said, I've seen it on Facebook, I've seen it on Daily Motion. I know there are some people that have mega upload links. I, I can't give any of these links to you, but just do your work investigating where to find to watch this. I highly recommend you watching it before we talk about it because it is worth the watch. It is absolutely worth the watch. Unlike maybe Waterboy. Mm. Yeah. All right, guys. See you next time. Bye.